Hey guys, I want to talk about this verse, Psalm chapter 16, verse 10, okay, or Psalm 16, verse 10, it says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption, okay? And I think this is quoted again in Acts by like Peter to say that it's also referring to Christ. And uh, so I was just going over a study that I've been wanting to do for a while about Abraham's bosom and uh, <clears throat> refuting that false doctrine. And this is a verse that a lot of people will use. Uh, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. And they'll say that Jesus went to hell. He went to the place where the wicked go, the final abode of the lost. Or they'll say... Um, that hell had two compartments. One side was called Abraham's bosom. It was a place of, you know, um, it was not a place of suffering. It was a good place. And then there's the, the other part of hell that's a bad place. So Jesus just went to the good part. Okay, so there's two ways that people use that, and they're both wrong. And I've said this before, and more studies need to be done on it, but we need to understand the word hell okay how how the word hell is used and i think there's a lot of confusion and the modern versions and stuff add to the confusion when they go to the greek and the hebrew and they say well there were different words um for hell like shoal and, and hades and it means the grave or it means death and this and that and whatever and, you know hell is just kind of like one of the worst like it's a word that we use to describe like like the worst place or the worst condition it's like total like anguish destruction despair you know death and, and and all that stuff like combined in a way you see a lot of verses in the old testament where um death and hell is contrasted and death or destruction and hell is contrasted and um so so when I read this, I think he says, you know, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. He means you will not leave me in a permanent. And, and I do want to say when he says soul, he means like himself, like his being. Um, there, there are places in Romans and stuff, I think it says like, let every soul be subject to higher powers or something like that. There's probably lots of examples where this is a figure of speech where a part of something is being used for the whole. So a soul... You know, the soul is is part of us, we could say, if, if we're talking about, you know, our actual, you know, spiritual self, or, uh, you know, I don't know how to explain it, but, you know, we got, like, mind, body, soul. Um, but there's a lot of instances where the soul, it's a figure of speech, and soul is being used for the whole person. So he says, you... He says, thou will not leave my soul in hell. He's not saying that, you know, he's not separating, you know, the body from the soul. And, you know, that's how people will interpret. They'll say when Jesus' body died, his soul went to hell. Okay, the place where the wicked go after they die. But that's a wrong interpretation. Okay. So soul just means me in general, my being, you know, God and this is David speaking in Psalms, though Peter uses it to apply to Jesus as well. But David's saying that God would not leave him in hell. God would not leave him in a permanent, eternal state of destruction and despair and agony. Okay, as Christians, you know, we have hope. We're never completely hopeless, okay? We will be victorious, okay, in the end in the next life and you know we're victorious now as well but so that's that's basically what he means that you will not leave my soul in hell and uh so like i said hell means it's like some of the like the worst word the word that we can use to describe like the worst place or the worst con condition okay suffering evil torment you know, like you've heard that war is hell, okay? So war is hell. You know, there's death, there's destruction, despair. There's really nothing glorious about war, okay? When people are just being slaughtered and, um, you know. 
So, war is hell. And so if that's in the Bible and somebody reads that, then, you know, people automatically want to interpret it, well, war is the final abode for uh, sinners, okay? It's like, no, that's not, not, what, not what hell means, okay? But we see hell used sometimes uh, as a name or as a description for the final abode of the wicked. That's because, in a sense, you know, it is hell. It is the worst place to be. It is everything worst imaginable. It is the ultimate hell, okay? That's what I would say. It's the, the final abode for the wicked, for the lost, for sinners, is the ultimate hell. It's the ultimate anguish and torment and destruction and despair and death. Okay. And it's interesting because I'm listening to this uh, two-part teaching by Brian Denlinger. And uh, it's on the Millennial Kingdom. And I might go through and get clips from it because it may be the worst, like the worst I've ever seen, which means a lot because he has so many bad. But it's just like one bad false doctrine after the other. You know, first of all, he teaches the millennial kingdom, a future thousand-year reign on earth, and, you know, that's false. He talks about the judgment seat of Christ, how, you know, saints are going to be given various uh, rewards. That's false, you know, how there's going to be different levels of reward for the saints in heaven. You know, it's false. <laughs> and, um... Just, I can't even think right now, but it's just like one false thing after the other. Uh, anyways. Yeah, there was some pretty bizarre stuff. Oh, there's one where he says that, you know, in the Millennial Kingdom, that the saints are going to be kings and priests. And he's like, well, some of us are going to be kings and some of us are going to be priests. It's like, I've never even heard that before. But no, okay, all saints, all believers in Christ, we're all kings and priests, okay, with Christ. He's the king and priest. He's a king and priest as well. And we are with him because we are one with him. Okay, so it's just absurdity after absurdity. And it's, uh... And then I recently heard him say that someone says that the lake of fire is hell. And he said well, the lake of fire can't be hell because death and hell are tossed into the lake of fire. <laughs> okay, well that's where like a misunderstanding of what hell is get you in the air, okay? Because hell, you know, it's saying death and hell, and we see lots of other places where we see death and destruction. We see hell and destruction. We see death and hell, okay? So they're all kind of together in a way. These are all horrible, terrible things, okay? Hell is just a state or a place of suffering, you know, just horrible. You know, I, I, I haven't got it all down perfectly to define it right, but, uh, so, but for the whole futurist view, there's just a complete misunderstanding of Revelation, and I'm still studying it to learn it and understand it. But I was thinking about how when you listen to somebody with a futurist interpretation of Revelation and stuff, and trying to correct it all, it's kind of like trying to untangle like Christmas lights. <laughs> it's like, here you go. Here's this uh, guy's interpretation on Revelation, and now I want you to correct it all. <laughs> it's like, well, uh, where do we start, you know? <laughs> There's just so much that's confused about that. That's pretty much what it's like, and I'm trying to do that. So, you know, it's going to take a while. But, anyways, so, and another thing that I wanted to say about this verse, for thou wilt not leave my soul, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Okay, so originally, I mean, David is speaking about himself when he says the holy one, my, you know, thine holy one. David's saying, you know, I am your holy one. Just like all saints, all children of God are holy in God's sight, okay. Um, but... Also, Peter uses it to refer to Jesus as, you know, the, the Holy One, the Son of God. Okay, so it's, it's like both ways. 
And then he says that you'll you'll not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. And uh, basically, I think that David, we see this a lot in scripture and stuff. David's basically just um, restating what he said. You know, he said, "Thou will not leave my soul in hell." You know, in agony and absolute despair and absolute hopelessness forever. And you'll and neither will you suffer me to see corruption. Okay, it's basically the same thing. You know, hell is corruption. Hell is destruction, death, agony, suffering, torment. That is hell, you know. Just like we would say, this is hell. You know, some of us experience that. You may be at work on some days. are like, this day was hell. You know, or maybe with people that we live with or something. Like, maybe we go through it every day. But that's because that's, that's what we mean. You know, this was... This was bad. This I suffered today. Today, you know, wasn't good. This was hell. Um, but anyways, I think that it's a stupid kind of interpretation where a lot of people take that and they think that when it says that thou will not suffer, you know, the holy ones to see corruption, and they say that it means that Jesus' body would never decay. Okay, that that it would never be eaten by maggots or whatever. I think that that's kind of adding to the text and kind of missing the the point. Okay, um, so I think the point is when we're applying this to Jesus that he uh, was going to overcome and he was going to be resurrected. Okay, um, so again, it's not he 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 wasn't going to to, um, you know, he was tortured and stuff, you know, on the cross, and he suffered greatly, you know, being, you know, beaten and whipped and all that stuff, but, you know, ultimately, Christ has victory, okay, and, you know, all of his saints, all the children of God share that with him, that hope, and, um, I think that's what it means when he said that thou will not suffer thy holy one to see corruption, okay? It doesn't mean that, you know, he wasn't going to suffer at all. You know, he did. But ultimately, okay, it, it means, you know, forever. That's not the end of us. That's not the end of us. That's not the end of Christ, okay? He was going to raise again. He's going to be the king, and, you know, he is the king. So... That's what it means, I think. And so I just kind of want to drop that interpretation of, you know, Christ's body not rotting and everything. Um, you know, what really happened to the body and stuff, who knows? I don't think that that's the point of this verse. Okay. But we really need to understand, you know, when it says, Thou will not leave my soul. First of all, soul is being used as a figure of speech to, it's a part being used for the whole. He, he just means me. Okay. Um, you know, and just like he says right after they says, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one, me. Okay, it's not just talking about, you know, part of him. He's not just talking about the soul. You know, in hell, thou will not leave me, my soul in hell, in a permanent, in a state of destruction. Okay. That's why he says, thou will not leave me there. Okay. That, I think that means, like, forever, you know. I'm not going to be left in utter despair and hopelessness, you know, always, okay, so, that's how I see it, so, God bless.